All right, welcome back. Hope everybody had a, uh, a great break. Um, the, uh, we, uh, today's topic is hot module replacement and we have a few guests. Um, Daniel has invited Yovi de Kroek and, and Fred Schott to join us. Um, and Fred is, I recently learned, the creator of Snowpack, if I'm not mistaken, um, which is topically relevant. And, and uh, Yovi, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, so uh, I worked together with Fred when we initially uh, were looking at HMR within Snowpack and I'm a maintainer of Preact. Uh, I wrote the, ES, uh, the HMR implementation for Preact components. Well, Maybe thank you for joining us. Um, Fred, you, <laughs> give your, your own bio. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I, as you mentioned, I uh, created and am leading the uh, Snowpack uh, project, which is a web application um, kind of web build tool, front end build tool and, and dev server that really leans into ESM. Um, so particularly relevant for all the standards work. And then also HMR is something that we've been really focused on um, providing a good experience with, which creates its own set of uh, challenges when working directly with the ESM uh, module graph. So yeah, very excited to, uh, to come chat with you all. The um, uh, we, we bring you to, uh, we bring this group together because uh, we have been investigating the compartments proposal, which is uh, in its in its uh, in in a layering, its second layer is the a module loader hmm. API that would allow us to uh, that would allow us to incorporate modules into the into the uh, two six two or first first class a uh, first class formulation of how to emulate the module system right. from from JavaScript. Uh, Daniel, do you have a few words? Uh, yeah, I'm glad this group can can come together. I mean. There, there are multiple ways we could think about the HMR problem at a, at a high level. So one way is by providing imperative hooks to uh, the module loading process, which is something that this group has been working on and also something that, um, you know, there's experience with in, in user space that leads a lot of engineers to ask for this to be added to, uh, to JavaScript and, and environments. Another way is through a higher level approach where we could add sort of direct capabilities for, for certain things outside of compartments. And I want to hope we, we can discuss the problem space at a, at a high level, like what uh, what is the semantics of HMR that we're, that we're discussing to, to get the scope right? Because are we talking about, you know, migrating instances or are we just talking about uh, rebinding the the live bindings of, that are exported, and uh, and then we could think about ways to to implement it. Does that yeah make sense as a framing? Yeah, um, let's. So uh, much of this group um, is probably uh, I certainly am not intimately familiar with how HMR works today with the various systems that that support it. My impression is that it's. Uh, I, but the, the, the intuitive design I would imagine it is, is that you would be um, from the point of, a, uh, of some subset of your working set that is modules that have been uh, edited, uh, that you would, you would be watching for edits and that would evoke an event that would cause those modules and any of the modules that depend on them to be reinstantiated with, but sharing the instances that were, pre, uh, that, that were not modified that they depend upon and that that would entail the need for hooks to hand off state that some applications like Preact would uh, would be implementing or libraries like Preact would be implementing in order to um, conserve some amount of state. Uh, yeah, would it help to give a, a quick just background on HMR or is this group? Yes. Reasonably yes. Familiar? Uh, yes. I, I am asking. Okay, for great. Let me, let me spend a couple of minutes on that. Um, uh, cause yeah, it's an interesting, yeah, so, yeah, 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 please, please. Okay. Yeah. Please, please do give background uh, starting from zero. Uh, yes. I, what so is HMR? I am completely <laughs> ignorant of HMR. Um, yes, I, I would love to. So HMR is hot module replacement, which is at its basic core, the idea of I edit a file and without having to reload the browser, um, that 
edit is basically applied into the uh, the page itself. So it, it live updates replaces the module in the module graph on the page. Um, this is not a production feature, but this is very important for development, specifically on the web, where a full page refresh could take some set, some amount of time. If you're working on some pop up or some view that's maybe a few clicks away, um, it's a really very popular feature of of Webpack and and roll up and any sort of um, dev environment. I think even going back before um, Webpack, although that's certainly reaching into my, my, my ancient history. Um, but yeah, it's, it's today at the very least a very popular workflow. Some people use it on the server, but really on the web, it is, it is essentially table stakes to a lot of people um, and really useful for speeding up that development. What's interesting for the ESM story <clears throat> and for the browser is that you can think of Webpack and, and roll up in any kind of modern um, dev environment today as the way they work, they basically end up replacing the module system or shipping their own module system to the browser. So at its core, you know, Webpack is a bundler, but really what it's doing is it's saying, I'm shipping this code to the browser and I own it and control it. I'm, I'm shipping the module system that I like. And that gives them the hooks that they need. So Webpack can basically say, this file is updated. Um, I'm gonna go and replace it in my module cache, which I manage myself as, as the Webpack client. Um, so this is a feature that, that up till now has been solved by just because there was no native module system in the browser, um, people would ship their own module system and, and build this functionality in themselves. What Snowpack is, is leading is this, this sort of new dev tool that's really ESM focused and relies heavily on ESM. So instead of doing any bundling in development, um, we are just shipping the ESM modules pretty much directly to the client. So letting the browser do its native fetching, its native reloading. Um, everything is this kind of one-to-one -one file mapping, which is very different from having to ship a whole module system. Um, we're just relying on the browser. Where that comes into complication is what does an update, um, a hot module update um, mean in the context of a session in the browser? So we can't do a full page refresh. This file has already loaded at, you know, like slash, you know, a.js. You know, a file has been loaded already. So to apply an update, you're suddenly stuck with the idea that you can't actually replace a module in place. Um, there is no idea of once a, you know, a file has loaded, it is essentially kind of cached and, and living in that URL. It's indexed by URL. Um, so we run into this problem where we can't actually update a file after it's been loaded the first time without doing a full page refresh. Can I, can I uh, ask some questions? Because there's, um, there's something I need for orientation. Um, uh, I've had exper a lot of experience with systems like Smalltalk where you can update code on the fly within a system of live objects. Uh, and there were certain um, uh, rough edges to that that seemed that were fundamental, that were ne never able to be fixed in principled manner. And I'm wondering if, if they're the same kind of rough edges here. So the, 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 the two that were roughest was anonymous closures if you've got a anonymous closure that's an instance, you know, that's, that's an instance of an old function code, and now you reload the module um, uh, where the function itself was anonymous, there's no obvious way to correlate the function that the closure used to instantiate with what function the, the closure should currently instantiate. Um, and then the other thing that was uh, uh, very rough in small talk was stack frames, uh, which in JavaScript would only come up uh, if the time of the reloading uh, is um, while there is a stack. If, you, if the reloading only happens um, uh, at turn boundaries when there's no stack, then at least you avoid the stack frame. But I still uh, can't imagine what you're doing for closures. Yeah. The great, great point. And I think, I actually don't know the exact answers. Jovi might. Um, but I think a really important point of this is that it's not automatic. So it's actually the, 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 the request on the platform here is basically the hooks to, to do this. But the actual implementation is actually user by user, site by site. Um, the HMR um, that we provide at Snowpack is essentially just the kind of hooks to say, okay, when an update happens, how do I apply it? Um, so if there's any sort of can ask, needed, you can uh, essentially can, can I ask a simpler question of what yes. semantics is Webpack implementing and like what semantics are, are you implementing? Are you talking about replacing at the module level or are you talking about replacing 
individual functions that are not exported because if the closure issue only comes up in that second yeah, case. Yeah, this is, it is totally up to you. Um, and I can share kind of the interface that the both of us use to do this, if that would help. Uh, no, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, because the up to you is where now I'm realizing I don't have a model at all of what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, Let me show at its basic what this interface looks like today. Um, and I, I will I will not get too deep into the weeds here, so I will try to. Oh, I can't screen share. Um, I, I will just, at least share. I have just allowed you to uh, screen share. I I, it. Almost, almost there. <laughs> Um, so this is a project that we started when we started looking at this for Snowpack, which is essentially just an HMR interface. Um, we called it a spec, but it was very much in progress um, for interacting with HMR on the client side. So basically accepting these updates. Um, mm -hmm. You can see Jovi here, he spent some time on this. Um, Evan Yu, who's been working on uh, Vite, has spent some, some time on this as well. Everything that's kind of in this new ESM-based dev tool is essentially using a flavor of this. Um, what it looks like at its most basic is just this check for something called hot if it exists. And we do the work to apply this interface onto the meta object. So we as Snowpack are providing this interface, which is essentially a way for the client and the server to do these handoffs of updates. You can see us here. This is a bit of our kind of uh, us having to do stuff to work around the limitation um, in Webpack. This is just kind of like, great, replace me as the kind of the default behavior. Um, what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, to get around this limitation, we apply updates to the current module. So there's a bit of a, the current workaround that you're seeing here. Um, but if you just like to focus on the interface itself, it's this I, I, idea I, I, of accepting you, updates. There's a more basic question here. Can when you, you just describe the flow, flow of, of this at all? Like how, how this even works in Webpack, if Webpack is the one that people are using today, and what happens when, like, how do you invoke it, and what happens when you invoke it? Uh, Mark, you had a question? Yeah, I'm also unclear who, who I'm, I'm also unclear who the players are. When you say we, uh, the, uh, you know, who is providing what, who is consuming what, I just don't understand um, uh, uh, how the response, who the players are and, and what responsibilities divided among them. Yeah, no problem. Um, basically, so, so we as Snowpack, um, as the dev environment, provide this interface. So Webpack provides their interface, um, Rollup provides theirs. Um, it's an interface for the handoff between an update between the server and the client. Um, each framework can kind of provide a flavor of this to connect into the rendering um, and trigger a re-render. So the idea of React um, or Preact with Jovi's case, um, providing hooks so that Preact can actually accept updates automatically. So the user doesn't have to write this themselves for every file. Um, the idea is that frameworks can also have a, have a say in this and kind of how does a uh, re-rendering, how does accepting this uh, updated file end up re-rendering my page itself? Um, in terms of the workflow, there's, I, I don't wanna get too far into the weeds here, but the basic, flow of an update happens somewhere in the leaf node. Um, it's part of that server client kind of communication where the server understands the client's module graph and will basically try to bubble that update up into it sees one of these accept handlers that can accept it. So if a file with an accept handler in it is the file that gets updated, it essentially just accepts itself. Um, the handoff there is just saying, hey, I have updated. Browser, go and fetch this update and then apply it using the logic found inside of the accept handler. Um, who writes the accept handler? This is the user. Who, who writes? The author of the module. Right. Who writes yeah. the accept handler? Yeah, the author of the module. The author of the module it. writes the accept Okay. Now in practice, there ends up being really, you know, because this is a little bit more complicated, it's a, you know, per file, there would be a lot of work to add one of these per file. The bubbling comes into play where if you're building something like well, really any one of these, if you're building a React, a Preact, Svelte, they all have this concept of re-rendering and that usually really only exists this kind of app root. Um, really, you only need to add one of these in, a, in, a, in practice to one of those app roots. Um, that's where it basically says, okay, any update that happens lower down in this, in this tree, bubble that up to here. I'm the thing that handles rendering, so I will make sure that this gets re-rendered. 
I'll clean up the older render and I'll, I'll re-render um, the new kind of module that I've loaded with this update applied. That is to say that uh, the, the bulk of components don't need to write anything um, uh, to, to engage with HMR. Um, and there's a sort of default behavior. If you change one of those modules, then it will inform, I'm guessing, up the dependency graph until it finds, uh, until it finds, uh, and if it finds uh, uh, one of these hooks installed. Is that right? That's correct. And if it bubbles up to the mm -hmm. point where there is no accept handler, we would then consider that uh, a full page refresh. This can't be handled. It cannot be accepted. So uh, we see. refresh. Um, I have a question about this bubbling behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually removed the idea of parent modules from Node because you can actually have multiple parents. What's the expected behavior there? Yeah, so we handle that by not relying on anything native to calculate that. We will just basically monitor what we serve to the user, um, so or to the browser. So we will, you know, basically for everything that we serve, we will do a quick static analysis of its import graph. Um, what it imports and what it um, what is importing it, and basically recreate oh. a a idea of the module graph server side, so that when we get that updated file server side, we can basically calculate and do the bubbling logic um, without asking the client or without any asking um, anyone other than our own. That, that seems fine, but what if there are two parents to something that is accepting an update? Right, it, that becomes, and that thing doesn't have a, a handler. So it definitely. Um, if one of those doesn't have a handler, we consider it unacceptable, or this cannot be applied successfully or, or correctly. Um, that also triggers a full page refresh. So just to rephrase that, if you have a module without an accept handler that has multiple parents, it won't do bubbling. Each of those parents um, kind of becomes a new bubbling path, a new path for this update to take. So each of those parents would need to have an accept handler for this to be accepted. So A and B import C and C is changed. If A and B both accept updates, they're basically saying we accept HMR updates to ourselves and our children. Um, our, we can apply this update to the module graph successfully and safely. Uh, and if, so if somebody in the future imports and becomes a two parent, or uh, two dependent uh, module, you can break reloading, is that correct? Yes. Because, okay. Either programmatically by calling something like invalidate here, um, or again, if we ever just detect through that bubbling logic that there is a, a, a path that does not lead to an acceptance, um, we will just trigger a refresh. Yeah, so the, the fallback behavior is that you get an automatic full page reload, yeah. which is better than a which is a better used developer experience than, um, in the worst case, it's a better developer experience than forcing the user to do, uh, uh, to, to press command shift R themselves. Yeah, we very quickly fall back to that as a kind of, you know, this is where this really benefits as someone is doing pretty rapid development or just, you know, they're making changes to a single file and trying to catch those, um, those updates. Um, if anything more complex happens and we can't handle it successfully, we pretty quickly fall out to a full page refresh. Assuming that the user is moving files around, maybe doing something more complex. And I'm assuming that it bails out on cycles too. Um, that I'm less familiar with. Uh, I'm if going I'm... to assume so, because otherwise very bad things. <laughs> Joby? If I remember correctly, um, I, it depends like we will we, we track visited modules, and if they've already been visited, they are seen as a uh, non-accepting part, uh, which then leads to a full reload. OK, yeah, that answers that. Oh, cycles in the module graph, yes, that's correct. Um, so if I, I think. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, there's a lot of details here. Webpack's documentation is also pretty standard. Um, and they have, you know, again, because they have control of that module graph, they have a little bit more uh, say in how an update gets applied. Um, I don't think supporting HMR is a kind of a feature of the platform itself, but more there are certain proposals in flight right now, which would really benefit this use case. 
Um, yes, and that and that is the context in which we're interested. Um, so, what what would the compartments API or whatever API for a module loader that it gets uh, that surfaces in two six two, what would it need to facilitate in order to make HMR something easier to implement? Um, and so far, what uh, so I, I still have more questions about the about the semantics. Um, is it the case that if uh, if, if what modules get reinstantiated when there's a reload? Uh, when when when, when, there, when a change is detected to any module in the module graph, which modules get reinstantiated? Which ones do not? It will basically follow the bubbling um, up the path. So if if leaf you know C gets updated, um, it will bubble that event up to the accept handler that 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 accepts that update. And that's kind of one of the, the things that we have to deal with here as an implementation detail is, okay, well, how do we actually apply the update for that leaf node into the application? We basically have to um, reload everything in its path up to that parent well, for, it to, uh, for it to so, be able to So apply. pardon, the, the transitive children of the module that has an accept hook? Yes, okay. all the way down to the file that was changed. I'm sorry, um, say that again. Only all yeah. the way down the module graph to the file that was changed. So every transitive child on that path will get reloaded. Um, Only to, the path, though. Yeah, because the URLs, again, in the file importing it, now that import URL has to be changed to point to the new update and so I on. You're the doing cache busting with the query string of some yeah. uh, essentially? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, the, which is maybe something that we could avoid. Um, Import maps have been discussed as a way to avoid that as well. Mm -hmm. If the again that, that doesn't solve the cache busting problem, but it does, you know, it does give you another hook into the uh, idea of what that I'm, URL represents. Could you could you define cache busting? Yeah, in the context of this, it's the idea of busting the cached, um, the idea that only one module can exist for each URL. So when we load your application, the file path is the kind of root, the the main thing that gets loaded in the application. If we want to update that, we have to actually load a new version at a new URL, and then repoint all importers to that new file. Um, so cache busting is the idea of actually breaking that connection from the original URL to the new unique URL for the update. Yeah, and this is usually done by appending a query string with a version yeah. with a version a version number, which we can do with ES yeah with with web. Well, with the web's notion of ESM, I think uh, so. Okay, this this brings so relevant relevant parts of the compartments API as proposed today are one we have uh, so we have designs in place that are not fully fleshed, but we intend to have a uh, an import meta hook uh, in the context of a compartment, which would give you a posi would which would give you a leg to stand on yeah. to introduce a hot object on the import meta. Um, so, I would, um, it, does, it, do, it does indeed do that. Uh, I am uncomfortable with that being the means for accessing the hot because, well, I haven't thought this through. Well, um, in, any, in any case, in, that isn't the only avenue that we could use in order to introduce the ability. Like compartments also support uh, lexical endowments and endowment yeah. global object, which would be equally suitable. You could introduce a global named hot in the context of a compartment. Um, could you have a unique one for each module? Do you need a unique one for each module? Oh. You do, you do need a unique hot for every module, which um, would- uh, With this API design, yes, yeah. but I think, I think stepping back a bit and asking what hot is doing might be useful. Mm -hmm. So what, what HOT is doing is sending a signal to all dependent modules. We can already establish a dependency graph uh, from the compartment API by tracking the host hooks. Um, so we have that and the question becomes, how do you propagate it into those modules? Currently they're using HOT uh, as a means to uh, accept the signal. Um, and so that's using import meta. Like you said, it could be a variety of different APIs and stuff like that. But I think really the idea that 
you're going to send a signal to your dependents might be a better basis than trying to model the exact API here and how to accept a generic value roughly. Um, so that, that's more interesting to me. Having to recreate a individual patching functionality per module, I don't think is avoidable. Um, uh, so, so some more questions? Go ahead. Um, the, call, the, the callbacks, um, are the callbacks a um, uh, callback once because the new module will typically go ahead and register uh, similar callbacks, um, uh, but that way the, the current callback code is always according to the most recent module, the one being replaced? Yeah, is this a question about ESM uh, HMR that's back? Uh, so I'm, I'm your... reacting particularly to, to the code that you showed. Yes. Yeah. Inside your accept, you do like, I think it's foo equals module dot foo. Yeah. Uh, uh... And the question here is, do you preserve the module that has that accept or do you re-instantiate it with a new module? Because it looks like you're preserving the module that yeah. does the accept. Yeah, so that's a good, uh, this is bordering into, yeah, uh, the workaround that we're having to do to get around this idea of a module that accepts updates. The purpose of that is saying that this is kind of where the update um, up the path, up the parent, up the import chain uh, will stop. And what that means is, well, we're coming to a place where we will no longer actually update the URL and do that cache busting. Um, so the idea is that the accept handler has to be written in a way that it actually applies the updates to the current module. So this module, anyone that actually accepts updates doesn't have that same behavior of being replaced. Uh, the accept handler exists to basically apply updates into the module graph that exists um, in the moment it was first loaded. So the URL of this never actually does change. By accepting updates, it says, I accept them in a way where my URL will not change. I will just instead apply updates into myself. So it does not get re-instantiated. It does. The way that we implement this is by running that import of the kind of cache busted version of it um, in a, a dynamic import. So behind the scenes, we'll go and fetch this new instance of module right here. But it will be loaded as an orphan of the actual module dependency graph. It will just kind of be existed so as this dynamic import tree that we then get to apply into the application. So the code that we're looking at as written in, in you know, module X, um, uh, when, you up, when, the, when the programmer updates the source code of module X and update this part of the source code for module X, the, um, you're not going to replace the accept handler with the revised accept handler that they wrote. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so there's a there's a bug there, right? Of I've changed the accept handler, and why didn't this update in the way I expected? Um, if we were smarter, we could say, okay, you've somehow changed the accept handler, and we've detected that um, this is no longer a valid uh, update. Um, but for now, that is a simply a bug. Hmm. Yeah, and and you can live with it because this is fundamental library tech that is probably not being edited by the application that is taking advantage of it. Yeah, we we are able to rely on two things. Um, one is that, again, in most applications, your only integration point for this is at the render call. So if you imagine a React, React application that kind of renders an entire uh, root of something, um, those render calls are much fewer than actual components in the site. So you end up only really having to implement one of these. And it's generally just basically calling, telling React to kind of do its thing, um, render a new version of the application. Oh, I see. Um, no, no. So it does. You, it, this does. This this hook does exist in application code. It just is an application code that rarely. But yeah. it, it is yeah. dynamic. But yeah, I was going to say the second is that Jovi could probably speak more to is the idea of frameworks actually providing even better hooks where they manage this themselves, so they can preserve state of components across updates, which is what Jovi had been working on. Yeah, I can shut like without going too deep on it. For instance, Prefresh is a plugin for Snowpack, which um, in turn 
relies on these accept handlers being there. So we register certain functions, which are our components. And when a, a module gets reloaded, we'll, we'll know the set of functions that are possibly new. When we compare them to the previous instance and cause a re-render on those new, with those new functions, then we'll see, for instance, that uh, new text has appeared on the screen or whatever. But what we in the background can do is preserve the state for set components so it gets carried over for the new function code. I think this also ties uh, in a bit with uh, the point Mark made about small talk. Like every framework will have their own logic to make a module re uh, hot reload because not everything is the same and uh, like everything has their own logic to, to use this new module or function code. Hmm. Um, the other things that where compart the compartments API comes to bear on this are for one, um, it decouple uh, the compartments API decouples the uh, the fetch namespace from the logical namespace of the compartment, which would probably um, be convenient for this feature because uh, the the uh, the mod the module URL rewriting behind the scenes to do the cache busting can be transparent. Um, that the, the, your, your imports don't change. Um, the, the, the loader API would allow for the, the module that is located for a particular module specifier to be different on uh, in a different compartment. Yeah, and, and again so, on that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so on that topic about having those, uh, have you seen any, pushback about memory usage going up over time? Because I know we've started to see that in Node with other workarounds like this. Yeah, I have, I've actually kept my eye out. My, my approach was when someone reports it, we'll deal with it and, and no one has reported it yet. Um, I think because it's so easy to just refresh the browser um, and it probably just happens through the course of someone doing web development over, over a long enough time. Um, we have not seen that reported as an issue. I am sure that we have memory issues um, as this grows and as it grows the module graph. Yeah, uh, th this, this is actually uh, uh, relevant to a point to us at Agoric because what we're doing at Agoric is not on the web, it's on a, uh, on a blockchain. And we're very interested in upgradability of smart contracts. Um, and we're also very interested in smart contracts uh, not indefinitely retraining re in all of the state of prior versions. <laughs> um, but Mark had some really neat ideas about how to uh, uh, bring something like HMR to bear on them. Uh, and ideally, ideally, we have a solution that works um, for both cases. If not, then. Yeah, there, there's, there's a, a, a big um, division between something like this whose purpose is development where you can always fall back to a refresh that, you know, that, that it doesn't need to reliably update old instances for production purposes blindly with no developer there to, to repair things. Um, uh, versus um, something that's used in development where if things go wrong, you can just refresh. And those are really two very different worlds. And the, um, and a good, a good um, you know, precedent for the contrast is that small talk, the update in place of code upgrading old instance state was purely development. Uh, it was also, by the way, extraordinary. You could be inside the debugger uh, going up and down stack frames, see a bug in the code, fix it, and continue the develop the the debug session live from point, uh, which 
when it worked was great. It would work like 90% of the time. And when it didn't work, then, then, then it was, it was, it was, you know, it was fine because you just uh, started again. Um, uh, the, the other side of the contrast would be uh, Java serialization where the uh, serialized state uses the fully qualified class name, uh, identifies uh, instance variables um, uh, by name, and then there's all of these uh, complex rules about what, what if you unserialize an old instance into a new class where, where the um, the, you know, it might have new instance variables or old instance variables might have gone away or typing might have changed. Um, so uh, the Java serialization was something that was intended for production and it had to, to really be very, very clear about what the upgrade rules were. I'm not inclined to do it the Java way, but I'm just saying that, that uh, doing it for production upgrade, uh, you know, uh, blindly for client data where there's no client side developer to repair things is just very, very different than trying to support the developer experience. Yeah, and I, I think that I think that the industry in general has uh, decided that that strategy is unwise in general because of like related issues with pickles, for example, with not being the like for example if you serialize your state in a python pickle and then deserialize it in a future version of your program you aren't actually guaranteed that the classes align um with the state that's contained in them and that can that is a frequent source of bugs um and i think that that's part of the reason we as an industry moved in the direction of using idls and tools like protobuf um, to be more explicit about upgrading state even though it's extremely expensive yeah. Yeah, so, so I think, um, so just terminology wise, uh, I, I can, it, it, would, it, what, would it work in the sense of not being conflicting with current usage to, to use upgrade consistently for the production problem, which is what Agoric is facing, uh, and replacement for the development problem? In Can you clarify the difference. What what is upgrade semantics? Uh, upgrade semantics is where um, uh, there's uh, existing live instance state. There's um, new code, and there's some automated process that. Um, uh, for, for bringing the, for transforming the old state and code into a um, uh, state that works to, with the new code, but is a successor to the old state. And that, and that the, uh, the 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 point about production versus development uh, is that um, uh, the upgrade process has to be one that can work with 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 understood reliability across all possible instances of the old code. Okay, so from my understanding, the upgrade would be a manual written function by a user to do that. Correct? Is that the expectation? Yeah, by the, by the author of the code. Uh, the author of the code writing the code to upgrade old state to uh, be state that instantiates the new code and the key thing is that the author of the code doesn't know all of the instance state. He's deploying the upgrade process to apply to instance state that the author of the that that the author of the code doesn't know about because it's 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 you know the, the multiple ins instances out there in the world of the old code. Um, 
I think I think the differentiation seems reasonable to me. I do know V8 is removing their ability to do that kind of in-memory replacement that you were talking about with Smalltalk. Uh, they've had that feature and it's no longer supported due to the amount of bugs it has. So they recommend doing this live editing in their deprecation doc, like you're describing. Um, okay. I think I think that sounds good. I think uh, there there are a bunch of other questions. If we do those manual uh, upgrade handlers. Uh, particularly around what happens when the module namespace changes. Um, so if a module namespace changes, that means you could add or remove uh, exports, which is visible in a variety of other places, particularly export star will be nasty. Uh, if yeah. you export star and then you do this, um, you you get into cases where you don't have access to the bindings that you are exporting that might need some kind of update. So I think there's gonna be more to it where if you do export star, you probably should reload those modules even if they aren't on the path, if that makes sense. Uh, but as, as long as it's a manual process, I don't, see any major objections. I think the, the major objection might be this signal propagating out to the host to cause the reload needs to be um, clear. And I don't think, at least, I don't think naively we'll be able to find a cross-platform solution for a single kind of signal to do that. I did not understand that. So let's take web browsers and node, um, if we produce a signal that causes this uh, reload to happen uh, for, uh, I don't know, development purposes, um, the host has to accept it somehow. The host could be the person creating compartments, for example. Um, I, don't, I don't foresee all hosts agreeing to the same signal um, whatever we send up and automatically working. I think it'll have to be per host for the most part. Um, it sounds like Snowpack has at least some specification for doing this across different environments. And so that seems good. Um, I just, I don't think we should try to enforce a standard of that reload behavior in the spec itself. Okay. Uh, I w wanted to ask a different question. Uh, it, it was raised before that the the semantics, if you don't provide the accept hook, is to just sort of recursively load parents up to you until you get one that that does. Is that is that accurate? I don't know if recursively load is how I put it, but it would essentially say defer that to the parent to accept it. Well, just just to elaborate, like all paths must end with a boundary. Like if one doesn't end, we you can't reasonably accept that update. So, um, um, yeah, like there's there's an entry point. There can be many entry points into your module graph, Dan, and those are going to be the things originally without dependence. Uh, this is going to basically have any node in the graph propagate its dependent modules until it either terminates from having visited all of its dependents um, and their dependents ending up in a termination. Uh, so um, since we have a graph, it's hard to use terms for this. Uh, I don't know a backward but... reverse term. <laughs> But the, the idea is this is related to the sort of cash busting strategy where you're, um, you're, you're loading and kind of rotating that hash until you get up to something that uh, does not 
uh, that, that has the accept header and then things that, I mean, the accept callback and then things that use it can sort of stay in, in place. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I'd um, say the, the cache busting is more the implementation detail of how we get this today in an ESM only environment. The idea of bubbling up or, or travel, traversing through the path, through the graph um, to dependence is more because there is no such thing as an automatic um, uh, acceptance of a, of a module update. Um, using the React example, to accept it, you actually have to re-render your application. So there is no way in that example you could actually automatically, as the platform, um, accept it. So it's more about the accept has to be logic provided by the user. That logic might say loading this is enough. Um, but it might also say, actually, to accept this, I need to uh, go do this logic, connect to my framework, et cetera. So it's more a limitation of there is no such thing as a reliable automatic update for every file. The more I'm so thinking do, about, oh, go ahead. Do, do we want any kind of de default update where just if you, I mean, if it's just things that, that if it's things that you imported and they're, they're live bindings that are exported and it already accepted it, then it writes it into the, you know, you have an accept callback that writes them into the export bindings and that's a way to use this API. Is this, um, I'm just trying to think about how this could work with different approaches to, to cash busting because this, um, this is something that I'm thinking about in the context of a standard bundling solution that maybe maybe this uh, these cache busting identifiers should be part of a separate request header rather than part of the URL or something something like that. And if this would affect the the design at all. Isn't there already a HTTP header? stating you don't want the cached form you get what it was yeah there's there's cache control headers um but as far as i know there's nothing saying you know this thing is temporary if something else comes along um in the import graph um replace it with that um, so i mean i guess part of what i'm wondering is if we want commands in the to control the the esm import graph to actually load or unload modules at all, or if the, the current way that the ESM, you know, module map works is, is enough. I mean, you talked about import, uh, import maps. And is, is your plan to make use of those at, at some point in connection with this? Because I think those also have this property that you can't go and change them later, like the module map. Is this property yeah. the way that is ideal for you? Um, in terms of what we're looking for, what would help this? Because I've described the interface and it, a lot of this is working around limitations. Um, there's a couple of things. One is the idea of having to traverse up the chain, um, traverse up the, uh, the import you know, dependence path. Um, to compare that to something like Webpack, um, they will not do that. They will just essentially replace the individual instance itself basically sending the code itself over the wire, um, eval that code and re replace it in the registry um, that they own for all of these modules. So in one sense, the way that we do this is because we're using URLs as the identifier, we don't control it. Um, there's something there about the ability to kind of patch in the single update and then combine that with, okay, and then here's how I accept it. Um, if you check out Webpack spec for this, they don't have the same problem of, okay, I have accepted an update but I'm still running the original accept handler. So I believe Mark, you were the one who pointed that out. Like what happens if you change the accept handler code? Um, in a world where you control mm -hmm. the module registry, um, you can pull in that new code and then that's actually accepting itself. So they don't have the same problem of, okay, well, there's this difference between a new file being loaded, but the acceptor having to pull the update into the already loaded graph. They're able to just push the update and that becomes the new module and then it runs the code of accepting. Can, can you go into more detail about how that works? Because I think uh, that that would help understand. I mean, it seems like this relates somehow to the uh, to this uh, cache invalidation problem that we were talking about. Yeah, 
so I, I think the two things to consider in this, this whole problem space is one is how do you apply the update? And then how do you load the update? And maybe in the reverse order is the better way to think of those. So loading the update into the module graph is where we hit that issue of a URL. Once you've loaded you know, the file at its proper file name, um, that thing just exists and you can't replace it. Um, so the, the uniqueness and the, the, the no control over replacing something by its URL when the URL is itself the, the kind of key, the index into the module graph. Um, the other side of it is just the application of that update. So again, because we have that limitation of the loading, we have to load the um, accepting module, um, but then apply it to the original module that was loaded in the graph. So we use those boundaries as essentially, this is where this one module will actually never change. By having an accept handler, we will never be replacing this with um, some kind of uniquely um, generated URL that will then kind of cache bust and, and eventually replace the original one. When there's an accept handler, we say, okay, this is a single instance that will never um, be, there will never be two of these running in the same module graph. Instead, as an accepting module, this will apply updates to itself. Its URL in the main module graph um, will not change. It will import this kind of secondary, almost orphaned version of itself. And then you see that module in the callback of the accept handler. It will take the things that it wants out of that and apply them to the, uh, to the instance that exists in the module graph, the original module graph. Is there ever a case where, you're, where you accept something and that doesn't have an accept handler? Um, not in the way we've implemented this. So an accepting module for for general purposes will always be replaced by a module that also can accept. Yes, the, the word replace just, you know, making a clarification that it, it does not itself get replaced by being an accepting module. It um, keeps its own instance within the original module graph and kind of applies updates to itself um, versus anything else that is not accepting is, is thought of as it can be kind of loaded a second time or a third time. Um, you end up just orphaning, and, and you, I think, pointed out the uh, the memory issues here. You end up essentially orphaning a lot as you develop. So if we if we had an API, for example, that was like import dot meta dot set, and it took a module specifier and a and a new you know thing that looked like a module namespace object, and it you know imperatively changed what the module map points to. Would this, I'm not, I'm not saying we should add this, but would this kind of thing give you the, the capability that, that Webpack has right now in changing its own module graph? Or what is the missing capability? Yeah, so that I believe it would. Um, the missing capability here is that idea of, I want to load this new version of the module and whether that's done via sending code literally over the wire and then evaling, or here's a new URL load this. Um, However that is loaded, the missing feature here for us is the idea of, okay, I now want to replace the existing module in the existing module graph. So at the original URL, replace it. Um, that wouldn't change too much about our interface, right? We would still need the idea of, okay, but then how do I accept this in some sort of parent? But it gets rid of that. Um, every time we bubble up, we have to kind of update the parent of that and the dependent all the way up the chain. Instead, we would just be loading <clears throat> the changed file and then calling the accept handler, now not in a new context or a new module or anything. It would just be called, assuming that it's dependency, its own already loaded imports, now point to the new place all the way down the tree. Um, that would bring us more in line with the kind of expectations of HMR today around not having to worry about this context of okay, applying an update to itself and having to remap um, its own uh, pack, uh, file's own imports one-to-one. -one. You could just kind of say, okay, by applying this update in the tree, I have using the live bindings basically um, replaced it with the newest version of this module. Thanks for explaining that. So I, I was pretty interested in this aspect of the HMR idea. I mean, the accept interface is, is good and I'm one of, well, I guess we're out of time, but for the, for the case of a non-accepting module, how would we feel about 
exposing an API like this to JavaScript, which was, uh, you know, which which let you uh, set these live bindings in that kind of way. How would we, is there some way that we could have some privileged code that, that would be positioned like that? Um, I don't fully understand what you're asking. Uh, how would it differ from the current accept handler? This is for the case where you're not within, where you're not using an accept handler, where uh, it's just supposed to update automatically because it just replaces what the what the module exports. But we don't know if the module shape changes across that. Like you could remove an export. Yeah, there's also the matter that are that, that currently the compartments API um, assumes an append only module identifier namespace. My my thought, uh, which okay, so which is which is on the table? Do we do we uh, do we alter that so that uh, uh, do we alter the compartment API so that it has some feature that would allow uh, some of its uh, some of its uh, internal module map to be invalidated and replaced um and uh which would have to be asynchronous in, incidentally um in any case my 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 thought on this with my intuition on this is like suppose that we change nothing nothing about the compartment api can we support this feature can we does the compartment api better enable um uh, frameworks to implement uh, implement this feature using this this low uh, this uh, well, this a, the, the, the module loader API in the language and I think that the answer is yes um, that that you would be able, it would be possible for example to construct a new compartment that at least partially shares some of the module instance with instances with its predecessor um, and then allow it to, uh, to to live on on its own again resuming as an append only um, module uh, module map um, but uh, I really I really, I really like that the idea that that the the uh, it's a new compartment best. that is successor to the old compartment rather than just a new module instance within an existing compartment that somehow replaces the old module instance in place um, yeah is that palatable I mean, that depends on how cheap it is to generate these. I mean, right now, a V8 context is a good 10 milliseconds to spin up still, you're, you're unless welcome. you have it hot. Remember not to cross the streams. That would be bad. Oh, uh, there are many ways you could mean cross the streams. What are you talking about here? Uh, I don't think I'm sure how to put it. I'll defer for now um i think what, that, did, what, what did you what did you mean by a new context what 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 context concept are you referring to um there there isn't a good mapping to our terminology at this group uh it depends on how expensive it is to generate a new compartment hopefully right. compartment context is isn't, real, isn't it well last i heard people don't want realm cross realm imports like v8's implementation last i heard was like very much tied to the implicit assumption that modules are gc'd when the realm is gc'd they would need to rewrite that yeah we're not we're not talking about instantiating a new realm we're talking about instant modules should be trivially i mean Modules should be featherweight. Modules should be extremely cheap per, per instance of a module within one realm. And that's and, and we can all already take a look at the excess implementation, uh, where I think they're they actually yes. are more expensive than they should be, but there's still there's multiple mod, there's multiple compartments being instantiated in a light bulb. So so Bradley Bradley's point is still valid that we will receive resistance from the uh, from V8 because they have not sufficiently decoupled the module system from the realm and uh, and that um, we need to overcome that somehow. As long as it's is, if we're only replacing it with a new compartment, it shouldn't be a major issue. 
but yeah. it, it would as, as, still yeah. require stuff. The, the compartment shim is relatively lightweight. Um, it's, it's, it's just a bunch of tables, a, a small number of them in any case. In any case, also, we are over time, and uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, uh, we thank Fred and Jovi for joining us and, and Daniel for bringing this group together. Um, and, uh, and hope that maybe you would like to join us for this conversation in the future. L uh, let me know if uh, there's a good time to put on the calendar if we want to, uh, to continue this conversation. Um, and uh, apart from that, um, I, I acknowledge you probably all have places to be. Um, and, and thank you again for coming. Sure, and I've got a little bit of free time after this, if people want to, I'm, I'm I will hold this window open as long as as long as the conversation needs to go. So, uh, just back to Daniel's question, I think exposing something seems reasonable to me at least. I don't know about the API design uh, of what that is. I'm not committed to any API design. I think they're. I have lingering questions about the uh, source of whatever this signal is. Right now it's coming in from the server somehow, and then it needs to notify the module graph. Um, and so are, are you just basically sending a signal to uh, any, any module by string, by href, whatever you want to call it? Um, so if foo updates, like that server needs to tell foo to start the propagation somehow. Um, and it, foo can't do it itself. Yeah, I, I, I agree that that would be outside of what JavaScript would define. I imagine if we were to create an HMR API then it might have an explicit thing that's like refresh the subgraph rooted at this module specifier. If we were going to design a high level API, and then it would be up to, you know, the some sort of framework to to get the message from the server when it should go do that. Yeah, so that's that's one end that I'm trying to figure out. I think doing it by URL or something seems fine. Um, what the actual signal is, I don't have any strong preference, slight preference that it should be generic so you can basically have the same ergonomics as try catch here. Um, per the acceptance criteria, you're, you're asking for some kind of barrier semantics, which I, I need to think on. Um, the barrier would be basically propagating out until you reach a depth that is entirely covered uh, with these handlers. Um, I need to think on that. I don't, I don't think that's so simple to do, but I do think that must be in the JavaScript spec itself, which makes me lean towards it needing us to introduce a capability for that barrier to exist. We already require um, engines to cover strongly connected graphs and cycles. Uh, so I don't think it's a stretch to have them add that. Yeah. If anybody has any ideas on how you want to propose a barrier of that nature it would be good to know. I may have lost the thread a little bit. What what is so roughly what your what what accept is doing is as if if we were to produce a signal to reload, you can think of it similar to an error that is being thrown. And when you throw it, every every dependent needs to have some kind of guard, like a catch. And if you- Pardon, is, traverse, this, a, is this a metaphor for tri um, is, or is it literally on a stack? Um, well, I, this is a metaphor. Um, okay, cool. 
the propagation uh, semantics would be instead of going up a stack with try catch, you're going up the dependent chains. Um, and once you reach a point, in, in, within, within, which in ESM semantics is not a stack, it's uh, it's a, a, a graph. traversal, yeah. Yeah. And once you reach a guard for these, in this case, the accept handler, you stop the traversal on that uh, graph node. And so you continue all other current traversals because there can be multiple active at a time. So if we have two and at depth one, we encounter an accept on one of those traversals, uh, we stop that traversal. And then in depth five on the other one, we encounter it and there are no other active traversals, then we've created a barrier at that point. Um, the barrier idea is just the computer science idea that you have a shared condition which must be met across all um, concurrent executions before uh, anything continues. Ah. Bye. Bye, Fred. Um, I think that Fred's description of the semantics of, uh, of, uh, of what's presently implemented with HMR is a great deal simpler than that. I, my understanding is that it's a, a, a complete tra traversal of the code graph and, it hap and if it happens to be that there are multiple accepts in that, uh, in that traversal of the code graph, it is ambiguous and it's discarded. So my understanding was if there are multiple accepts, it's okay. It's only if there is partial accepts that it's rejected. Yes. So when we have module C that is imported by A and B, um, two distinct modules, when we update C, we will go through those two. If only B accepts, we can't handle that update because A would become stale. So we have to refresh. If both A and B refresh, then we know that the import for C in both those modules has to be invalidated and we have to re-execute A and B with the new C. That is like, I always like to see it as uh, Brad alluded to as a sort of boundary or, or shield where you stop and you know that that is your starting point. Mm -hmm. I think we could at least write up some visual examples um, and then come back to this. I can write up some as well. All right. Well, uh, give, uh, given that we're over time, I think that what we ought to do is put some more time on the calendar when Jovi and Fred are both available. Um, and and uh, we meet regularly at this, at this time every week. Um, so uh, a, a proposal for a time is welcome. I, I think that yeah, we we're booked for I think one or two meetings ahead, uh, but we can come uh, we can revisit this when when we've had some more time to to think about it and come up with a proposal. Um, we'll, we'll just uh, keep that door open. All right, um, I'm going to stop the recording.